Ginny Dietrich, are you ready to be fearlessly questioned today? <laughs> Maybe. I like a little more confidence, Eddie. Can we sound a little more confident? <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but yeah, I'm ready. All right, we'll see what we can do. So before we, we'll just ease you into it. We'll just okay. kind of let you ease into this. We'll, we'll let you take center stage here, let you run the show for a little bit. Uh, why don't you tell us your story as it relates to your journey fearlessly questioning public relations? Wow. Well, I was born a poor black child. <laughs> the jerk. That was the jerk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I actually was an English major, or am an English major, and I was going to go to law school because I wanted to negotiate contracts for athletes, <clears throat> which I would still like to do. So maybe I should realistically question that instead. Um, but my mom talked me out of it. She said, "You know, you won't be good in law. You won't be a good attorney because." And she's right because I think she was thinking about trial attorneys, and I would have been terrible at that. Um, but back then, I just didn't have the wherewithal to understand that there were different kinds of law that you could do. Um, so I didn't go to law school, and I ended up needing to get a job right out of college, and I went to work for Fleischman Hillard, where you know, I started at the very, very, very lowest part that you can start in a PR firm, and I made copies all day long of media clips. And Joe, you won't remember this because you're not old enough, but in the good old days, there were color copiers that you would, it would color, it would copy the blue, and then it would copy the pink, and then it would copy the yellow, and then it would copy the black, and then it would do one more run so that the color copy was all done. So I had to make color copies of all these media clips and let it run five times for one story. Yeah, I mean, I may not be old enough to remember using a color copier, but I remember when my dad's, well, where I work now at our family agency, I remember when we got a color copier. That was big news. I don't know how old you think I am or how young I think I am, but come on now. It's, You're anyway, probably continue. like five when that happened. I don't know. I, don't, I forgot to date it in my, my little baby book, but... <laughs> But continue. I don't want to disrupt your story anymore. <laughs> no, you can disrupt. That's funny. Um, <clears throat> so I, because I stood there, it probably took four or five minutes just to make one color copy of one stinking article. I had nothing else to do, so I would stand there and read the articles. And I was in a meeting um, with a client because they let me sit in the back and just take notes and listen. And the client asked a question, and nobody in the room knew the answer. And I was like... Let me and so they they let me answer the question, and my boss came to me later and said, "How did you know that?" <laughs> I said, "It's because I stand here and read the. I don't have anything else to do but read these stupid articles." And so I knew all about this client because I'd been reading all of the media mentions about them as I made copies, and I got a promotion right away because of that, which was great. And I sort of just worked my way up and um, started my own firm nine years ago, and here we are. <clears throat> I think there's a very important life lesson. So that, I mean, you got a promotion because you didn't have a smartphone, because you didn't have Twitter to be scrolling through at that time, and all you had to do was read the information that was in front of you, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was no smartphone back then. So kids, put your smartphones down. Twitter's just rotting your brain. I'm kidding. <laughs> so that's it. So you go from reading, uh, you know, waiting for color copies to be made to being a PR industry leader. Is that about it? That's about it, yeah. That's about it? Okay. <laughs> Well, we'll try and fill in the gaps along the way here. Um, but we might as well get to the main event right off the bat because I'm not a very patient kind of guy, and we'll just you know, uh, give everyone what they came here for. Uh, so the biggest question that I wanted to bring you on, the most fearless question, I guess, that we could ask. Um, if I come up with something that's better later, you can tell me, but this is the only one that I've got right now. Okay. Um, okay. It, it seems to me that public relations, PR, and a couple different industries, it seems like... Um, I mean, but PR specifically, it's it's really just, is it a matter of just good content and the ability to say, I'm sorry? Yes, that's all it is. And now you can make the big bucks, too. It, it, would you care to uh, tell me why I'm right? No, it's not. Um, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I saw that one of the things that you wrote at leading up to this was that I would probably more nicely say that just because you can talk doesn't mean you're a communicator, but it's true, just because you talk doesn't mean you're a communicator, although many of us think we are. Um, the industry certainly has a, a low barrier to entry. It's funny because I'll have friends say, oh, I think I'm going to go from sales to PR because it can't be that hard, and you're like... It's a little bit harder than that, but okay. I mean, I couldn't go from PR to sales, but 
I was going to say, I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're trying to say about sales here, but we, we might we might have to have a little disagreement here. But uh, continue. I'm not saying anything about sales. I'm just saying it's it's not easy to transition from one career and one expertise into PR just because you can talk, or say I'm sorry. Um, for sure, content is a big part of it, but I also think that content belongs to not just PR but marketing and advertising, um, search as well. Um, executives, all those kinds of things. And, you know, with crisis in, in, in particular, especially when you're saying you're sorry, there are definitely ways to do it because I want you to pay attention to how you, in your personal life, say you're sorry. It's human nature to say, I'm sorry, but you were wrong about this, or I'm sorry you feel that way, but, and that's just like, even when you're having a disagreement with your wife, I do this. It only happens with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this with my husband. I'll, he'll, I'll say, I'll start to say, I'm sorry, but you did this and this and this. And then it's like, well, wait a second, that's not an apology. And that's our human nature response. And so you have to really practice, just as human beings, to to really apologize and, and mean it and not say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, or I'm sorry you feel that way. I think you're an idiot or an in inadequate because I did these. And that's that's the sort of, Response that you're saying without saying it. So yeah, I'm sorry it doesn't work. Okay, and I said something yesterday with Ryan that seemed to um, relate to people. But <laughs> let's say we had a a, a a course, a prerequisite course on just basic human principles, and then we taught people how to say I'm sorry. Then could that be everything that that PR is right now? <laughs> no. No, still not. Uh, no. So okay. this is how I break it down with within my agency. I call it the PESO model, P-E-S-O. You have paid media, you've earned media, you have shared media, and you have owned media. So paid is, we don't touch advertising in terms of Super Bowl ads and print ads and those kinds of things. We touch advertising from the perspective of, or paid media from the perspective of, like, Twitter cards and Facebook advertising, you know, where it sort of integrates with the stuff that we already do. Um, I put lead generation under paid media because you have to pay for the email software and all that kind of stuff. Um, earned media is your typical media relations, so that's you know getting on the front page of the New York Times or in your insurance trade publication. Shared media, of course, is social. Um, we changed it to shared um, because we think it's bigger than just Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, um, and it part it eventually will become part of everybody's job. So it's about sharing information and sharing uh, context, and then owned, of course, is content. So you have those four pieces, and from a PR perspective, you have to understand how they all integrate and work with one another. M lots of people are really good at one thing. Many people are not very good at integrating the four. And what is that integration? I mean, if you had to rank them, like give me a power ranking as far as something that you know businesses should focus on, how do you prioritize those in your agency? You know, it, it actually depends on what the business does because if you, let's say you work for the Department of Justice, you're not going to use owned media and social media. You're going to use, because you don't know who your customers are, you're going to use paid media and you're going to do it in places where large masses of people hang out. So that you're going to do it like at, in stadiums and places like that. If you're um, Miami, you might put up a billboard that says, Dear LeBron, you're welcome and has two pictures of the rings. <clears throat> in um, Akron. You know, things like that. Um, so, <laughs> I did that for you. Thank you. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you don't know who your, your customers are, then paid media works really, really well. If you know exactly who your customers are and you sell to the masses, so a consumer business like toothpaste or shampoo or something like that, shared media works really well, so you want to prioritize that. If you're a B2B organization and you sell to maybe 50 companies, Owned media is going to work specific, really well specifically for that. So it really depends on what the business does. Now, I guess, and this is, a, this is the small business uh, guy in me coming out. I mean, it's something that is so important with so many different moving parts. It does feel like there's a bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe elitism as far as, I mean, like, we could never have our own PR agent, it seems like. It wouldn't just be in the budget. It wouldn't be in the cards. I mean, I know what you guys charge because we had talked earlier about my sister's in PR. I know exactly, you know, kind of how that works. Uh, I mean, is, is it something that we should consider? Is is that something more businesses should consider, or is it really only for the, the guys that play on the big stage? Well, I think there's different stages. Um, there's certainly some DIY stuff you, that you can do. You know, 
it used to be that you would hire a PR firm for crisis for reputation management to manage events, which a small business wouldn't do, or for their relationships for the Rolodex with journalists. Well, now you have access to those same journalists that we do, and you know your business better than we do. So if you if your goal right now is to get attention from bloggers and journalists in, in business publications and in your, your trade publications, then you absolutely could do that yourself. I mean, it takes some relationship building, it takes some network, it takes some time, but yeah, you can do that yourself. You don't have to pay a PR person to do that. Well, and I was going to share, you know, and where I was getting at with the whole content thing, and I'll share kind of my <laughs> personal experience with that, um, is, you know, what I was kind of saying, when I get at content, I mean, if, if you're sharing content that is honest and transparent and telling your story pretty much on a regular basis, there really isn't much to, you know, you know, there's little education that needs to be done after that right. from a, you know, right. you know, consumer to business perspective. Um, and then as far as attracting, you know, like you said, those media relations, I mean, I just write articles on our insurance agent's website. I do videos, and, you know, I've been featured in, I don't know, a handful of you know industry mag top industry magazines just in the last six months. Right. Because they're looking for people who talk about healthcare reform, and they find me. Um, I did. I just did, and, and this is crazy. I just did a one-off video on long-term care. I never talk about long-term care. Like it's a thing. It ended up on a story on Life Health Pro, just randomly. Just hit. There it is. So, I mean, it's just these are the types of things. If you're doing good content, right. is that not going to be majority of businesses' public relations in in a, in a sense? So yes, it is, and I'll, I'm actually going to give you a sneak peek. I'm running a blog post. We do every Friday. We do this in sex and positions, so we interview one person. And I have Matt Collier, Collier on tomorrow, and I asked him what industry advice or practice would you like most like to cry foul on, and he said, "The social media experts, ninjas, gurus who say that all companies need all they need to do to win at social media is to create awesome content." And I think that goes directly to what you're saying because. We keep hearing that. Create really valuable educational content. Tell your story, tell your story. And it's so hard for so many people to do it. So when you do it well, like you do, you raise up, you, you quickly rise up the ranks and to the top where your competitors can't keep up because they don't know what you're doing. And it's so easy for you because you're like, well, I'm being transparent and I'm being is honest. That, is and that I'm, my fault? I mean, that's no, not it's my not fault. your fault at all. Absolutely not. But I think it's easier for some people, you're passionate about it, you're, you're working in your family's business, it's something that you want to be doing, and you've taken this expertise and really built something around it where most, not most, a lot of people don't really even know where to start. I don't really, I kind of want to accept that, but I don't. I, I don't know what else I can say to that. We're going to, I think, have to agree to disagree on that one. Um, I do want to kind of pivot to some of the examples that you do have on your blog. Wait a second. No, 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 no. Oh, just, why, are we getting, why are we disagreeing on this? Because we, I mean, organizations hire us to create the, their content for them because they don't, they can't do it. They're, they're not like you. They're not like me. They can't, they physically cannot do it. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, but I guess to say that creating good content doesn't work, it does. It's just. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. I'm saying cre creating good content is really hard for people to understand how to do. Well, again, I think this is an, ah, okay, good. I'm glad you said that because I think the problem at this whole thing is is that um, it really comes down to their inability to understand their customers and to think like their customers and to have any sort of like level yes. of empathy. And I think yes. that's the problem. Yes. Um, and that really drives me nuts because it's not that hard. At least, I don't know, maybe it comes natural to me. But it's not that hard. It's like the easy, if you, you have no business being in whatever job or business if you can't do that, I think, my opinion personally. But um, I guess it comes natural. You tell me. You work with a lot more different people. so. Um, I think it probably comes more naturally for you than it does most people. Um, I think the other thing that happens is, I think there are two other things that happen. One is that, we were trained to write in business speak, you know, all through college, and then we graduate from college and we go into the workforce and we're taught, taught to, to write in a specific way. And it's not to give away proprietary information and it's not to talk about you know, the insides of the business. And, you know, five years ago, all of that changed. So if you had a career up to that point where you were taught how to write a certain way and now you're having to do it differently, it's really hard for people to make that change. The other thing is, unless it's coming from the top and the top is saying, we're willing to take some risk and we're willing to talk about our secret sauce and we're willing to let you, you know, 
talk to our customers and have a two-way conversation, it's not going to work. And most executives are not willing to take that risk. They're just not. You just—I couldn't have scripted this thing any better because you're really just leading me right to where I want to go here. And that's really—I mean, uh, honestly, that is the entire point of this show: is that what you just said is like, listen, we're not willing to do that. Well, guess what? This was five years. You've had five years to think about it. If you right. can't make that decision in five years, then you're going to be out of business in right. another five. Right. Um, and that's what drives me nuts: is that you know, listen. I mean, I'm 30 years old, and I figured this out a little bit, not tons. I'm not you know successful by any stretch of what I would say. But there are people that are 20 or 19 that are coming up behind me that have got this figured out even more. So if you're not willing to kind of just say, listen, this is what I have to do. This is an adult decision that I have to make. And this is one thing we're going to. I'm going to be talking with Chris Brogan next week about this, about growing up in business. And I think that's it. What you just said that. Growing up, I don't care if you want to, you can or whatever. It's just you have to do these things if you want to stay in business. You have to. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on the road speaking to um, CEO groups. So, you know, groups of people that own businesses or lead businesses. And I still hear, and it's, it's still astounding to me that today I still hear things like, well, by the time this affects my business, I'll have retired, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I hear that all the time. Yeah, it's kind of scary, but it's um, scary. <laughs> but um, you know, well, it's enough. We don't need to beat a dead horse any more than we already have. So um, I did want to bring in some examples from your blog. I don't know if we're gonna have time. Let's see if we'll, we'll maybe come back to them at the end. But right now, I do want you to. We do have a couple of people watching. Um, I want you to go ahead and ask your audience. Um, one fearless question. You know, let's turn the tables a little bit. Let's let them get on, on the action, see how it feels. I mean, you're over there sweating, I know, probably. Uh, <laughs> what is something that you would kind of always wanted to ask them? Again, maybe it's appropriate, maybe it's not. This is the perfect form for that to happen. What do you want to know as far as a fearless question from them? You know, I would really like to know what they expect from a, a communicator, from a PR professional, if they were to hire somebody. What do you think they would expect? I think it's probably all over the board. If you had to give me one guess, your top, your top, like if we're playing Family Feud here, what's the number one survey says? I would say probably that they would expect that they're going to get all sorts of media mentions all over the place if they hire somebody. If they hire media mentions again, because I, I want to, I want to come back on media mentions, and this is the whole understanding exactly what you do sort of thing. I mean, yeah, it's fun and nice, and it kind of pats yourself on the back when you get in those industry magazines, but honestly, what does it do? I mean, because it's not your audience, it's not your customers, it's just, hey, listen, I can do what I do and people in my industry know about it. It means absolutely nothing to me, in my opinion. So we stopped doing media relations only um, four years ago, and that's the very reason, because we kept we kept finding that the clients would say, yeah, I want to be in this publication, I want to be this, and, and a really good example of that is um, we had gotten a client on the front page of the Wall Street Journal below the fold. That is like nearly impossible to get. And he walked in my office and he put the New York Times down on my desk and he said, thanks for the Wall Street Journal article, it did this to our traffic and blah 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 blah. But here's this runs in, here here's this article in the New York Times and our competitor was mentioned and we were not. What's wrong with you? And I was just like like two days ago we got you below the fold on the front page of the freaking Wall Street Journal. So I said, I'm done. It's all about ego. It's not driving what we need it to drive. So if somebody calls and they say they just want media relations, we will not do it. If it's not integrated and helping them drive business, 100% we won't because I agree with you. It, it's nice. It's a good pat on your back. It's a nice ego stroke, but it doesn't do a lot. Um, well, I think you hit on something too there, and, and, our, and uh, I know you're good friends with him, Marcus Sheridan. He he bangs this drum quite a bit about you know you know ideal client. You know you want to find somebody that's a good fit, and somebody that's coming to you you know two days after you just delivered them a gift <laughs> from God and says, well, hey, uh, can I have another one, please? That's probably not somebody you want to do business with. And we didn't. We parted ways. I think that's something that all, businesses also have a hard time understanding, too, is who they want to do business with as well, not just... Well, I think you're right, and it's really interesting to me, and I talk about this often, that um, when we're talking to prospects, we do a ton of questioning. We interview them to death. We're trying to figure out if they're a good fit for us. Nine times out of ten, they've never even looked at our website. It's astonishing to me. Well, you got, you got to, again, back to Marcus, you got to take the assignment selling approach. You got to say, hey, listen, before we even uh, consider right. talking with you, hey, why don't you go and give yeah. me a 
20 minutes of your time reading this 30 page ebook or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I brought that, I know I brought that up in, you know, just my small family age. They, they look at me like I'm just growing a third eye in front of them. It's just like, <laughs> what? We're going to tell them to do something before we, they, they want to buy it from us. It's like, hey, come on, guys. Like, okay. but, you know, um, so yes, I mean, um, I think I think a lot of that you know we kind of agree on, um, but I do want to kind of come back to just kind of the um, maybe the organic nature of of some good public relations, if you will, and it just you know sometimes um, you know not understanding your customers or your audience or whatever is is really the the biggest problem. Um, so you wrote something about Weird Al. Um, it was last week or this week? I'm yeah, not I think sure. it was last week. Yeah. Um, how he did his whole, you know, eight videos, eight days thing, and he, you know, hit number one for the first time in his career, and it was all basically to prove his record label wrong that he couldn't release an album because they didn't want to release it. And what is, I guess, if I were to say to you, what is there to be said about somebody just saying, "Listen, this is going to be fun. I understand my audience. Let's do this because it's going to be a good time." And oh, by the way, it'll probably work. I think that's fantastic. I mean. That would be a dream client for us. We'd be like, oh. <laughs> um, so if Weird Al is watching, uh, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't need our help. He's got, he's got it. <laughs> but I think you're right to go back to if you don't understand who your customer is and what they what their pain points are, you're not going to be successful at any of this. I mean, is that is how much of that is public relations? I would say understanding your customer and who they are is probably more sales than PR, but integrating that then your buyer personas and all that into in, and the buying process into the way you communicate to them. So how do they make their decisions? At what point do they, you know, need top of the funnel versus middle of the funnel versus bottom of the funnel content? That's that's where the PR piece comes in. Um and that kind of leads me to um one of my I guess last fearless questions, not last, but one of the bigger ones. Um, I mean, it seems like a majority of your 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 position, your point of view, your life's work is about changing this industry as far as its perception. It seems to me that you might be better served to create a new one uh, as opposed to trying to change the one that already exists as, as opposed to like an airline that crashes and then you know resurfaces as a different name. Uh, it seems to me that you know we've said sales, we've said advertising, we've said marketing, we've said PR, all within the matter of about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, all of which, I'm my guess is, you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, all of which are going to look more and more similar as the yeah, years progress. Yeah. Is, is that person that says, well, we're not PR, we're not advertising, we're not marketing, we are whatever that word is, I'm not smart enough to know what it is, because if I was, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. But... Um, <laughs> Whatever that word is, would you not be better served to be creating that instead? Um, yes, and there's a divide in the industry where it's sort of the old guard and the new guard, and the new guard is still refers to themselves as communicators or PR pros. But they're doing all these other things. They're blurring the lines. They're bringing all this on. And the old guard is still doing the things the way things are, have always been done. So eventually, the old guard will die off, um, and those business models will not be functioning any longer. So I think communicators will still be communicators, but it'll be an integration of several different skill sets. I mean, because right now it seems like marketing is kind of overtaking everything. They're kind of they're leading the race, I would say. Marketing is becoming the dominant term. Um, and I'll pull up a question here that we have from Laura Williams, and she says, um, "What would you say to someone who is handling their own marketing?" Again, there's that M word. Uh, what is the one thing that can help them get the most distance? Blogging, 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 blogging. blogging. The one thing, blogging. Really? Blogging. Is that, you're yeah, gonna go blogging? I'm going blogging. Uh, can you elaborate and tell me why a little bit? Um, I mean, just based on my own experience, that has, that is what has catapulted us. Um, you know, I mean, it's been an how long has it been? Eight year process. I was going to say, tell me when you started blogging because I think it that's was very September relevant. of two thousand six. So All right. Eight years next month. Okay. Oh, it'll be eight years next month. Right. Um, but 
you know, using the social networks to distribute the content, doing it through email marketing, those kinds of things. That's really what catapulted us. Um, I'm very, very big on community and having conversations with customers and, and prospects and doing it through the, the comments section of the blog. 80% um, of our revenue today is generated because people read the blog, they participate in the community, they like the way we think. So where it used to be we did lots of word of mouth and referrals, it all comes through the blog now. That and speaking. I'm going to hit you with this because I, I agree with you, but I think that that answer to that question, I'm going to just be a little fearless on this, I think that answer to that question is going to uh, start to quickly change, and here's why. You can tell me what you think. You can tell you just you can say, Joey, you're crazy. I don't even know why I'm talking to you right now. Uh, perfectly within your rights to do that. Um, but we were both at social media marketing world back in March, right? And I think it was Michael Stelzner's uh, one of his his keynote or his closing note. I can't remember which one it was, but he had said, you know, he gave some sort of stat on the um, influence the podcast that they do had on the people that actually bought and came to this event. And it's just the fact that, listen, you're spending an average of maybe two to three minutes reading a post uh, to 30 to 45 minutes actually hearing and or seeing somebody. Uh, and you're talking about that community and that connection. And ultimately what we're talking about is trust. Um, is that not, you know, I guess you might be a little ahead of the game right now, but wouldn't you maybe be better served to go deeper on that stuff now? Um, well, since there's 2.16 trillion blogs now, I can't remember exact count. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of blogs, and I think blogging doesn't necessarily have to be the written word. It can be videos, it can be podcasting. Um, I also think that you have to take into consideration how people learn. Uh, I think it, the stat is 65% of us are visual learners. It's 64%. So, I just watched the talk on your website. It's <laughs> 64%. Um, I'm quoting you, so I, it could be wrong. If it's wrong, <laughs> that's sort of my source. I don't even remember the right stat. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so two-thirds of the human population are visual learners. So if you think about content, vlogging, then maybe it's video. Of course, you have to you know, keep in mind that you need 300 words on the blog post so that you have SEO purposes and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it could very well be video or podcasting. You know, we have a podcast that I do with two guys in Canada that does okay, but it certainly doesn't generate the kind of revenue the blog does. Well, uh, and I listened to, uh, in my preparation for this, I listened to the podcast. Uh, the most recent one that you had up there is it? I mean, are you just not focused enough on it? Because I, I the guy, one of the guys that made the introduction said like this was a surprise that you actually did it three weeks in a row. So is it just <laughs> that maybe not the lack of focus? Well, I, you know, I mean, we are very, very yes, we were very, very good about it in the beginning, and I think we've got a little lackadaisical because it's it's not generating revenue. So we were very good about it in the beginning, and for about I mean, we're on year five now, so it's hard to keep something going when you're not generating it. <laughs> interesting, interesting, interesting. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you that your numbers are wrong, but uh, I mean, you know, in my experience, just again in, in small business, it's you know, uh, my goal is is how do I build that trust as fast as I possibly can and as as deeply as I possibly can. And you know, obviously, I think you need to look at your business too and sure, you know, what type sure. of business you're in. But yeah. for me, you know, selling face to face, you know, it's video, and it's you know, that's going to be the easiest way to get somebody to say yes, I want to, I like this guy, or no, he's he's completely out of my league. I don't want to even come close to touching him. So. Well, yeah, and then, like I said, I mean, blogging has for, for us has been really big. And in fact, I, we just got a new client because she reads the blog and likes the way we think, and she didn't bulk on price or anything. So, I think you're right. It depends on your business, but it it has been very very successful for us. And um, I'm going to wrap it up on a, on, a, on this note. And while we wrap it up, I mean, we, we've got a couple people sticking around. If there are any questions that want to be asked to Jeannie before we wrap up. Jenny, before we wrap up, I said I was going to do it once. I told you I was going to do it. I was going to say it wrong. But uh, if there's any other questions, feel free to get them in. But um, and I, I want to ask this to a couple of people that are you know you know uh, very well versed in these social spaces. Uh, I guess this comes back to the whole empathy and, and just kind of the um, natural ability that some people have. Um, and we talk about how do we get more engagement, interaction, and social media, and all that fun stuff. And I guess you know just our content in general. Um, 
is I mean, is it just the fact that we're we're doing it with preconceived notions that we want something out of it that we're just not doing it from the best place? Is that listen, this is to drive business, and as opposed to saying listen, I'm doing this to build community and, and relationships. Um, the only example that I have for this is there's there's a kid I, I doubt you know who he is, but his name is Marquez Brownlee. Uh, he goes by MKBHD on on YouTube, and he's got over a million subscribers. He's been dubbed as the world's best tech reviewer in like several major publications, wow. and he's he's only 20 years old. Uh, wow. which is the crazy part. And if you go look at his stream on pretty much any social network, um, you know, about a million, million and a half followers, and if you compare that to, like, Guy Kawasaki or, or anybody else that has five or six million followers, I mean, the, the ratio to, you know, uh, followers to engagement is out of, you know, off the charts. And, I mean, can you say, okay, Guy Kawasaki getting, you know, putting a, publishing a post that gets 15 plus ones, with six and a half million followers, a failure? I would probably say so. I would say so. Uh, and then a kid with a million and a half getting 635 plus ones. I mean, it's just, it seems like that, you know, the kid coming from it, you know, from the most honest of places is going to, you know, win out, it seems like. You can say whatever you want. I don't know if there was a question in there. There might have been. But... Yeah, I agree with you because it's interesting that you say that because when we started on all of this, it was just to figure out what the heck it was. And, you know, when when I was on Twitter in 2008, every Tuesday at lunchtime there was a big party and somebody played music and somebody brought snacks via the via photos and, you know, we just had a big party for an hour on Tuesdays. And it wasn't, it wasn't to generate business or to do work together. It was just kind of networking and having fun. And some of those people that I met on those Tuesday afternoons are not only some of my best friends today, but also clients or business referrers, and it, and it didn't start out that way. So, yeah, I think you're probably right. Is that something that maybe, I mean, we should look at a little more, I guess, look ourselves at the, look at look, look at ourselves in the mirror a little more often on, or do you think it's just, well, we have business objectives? I mean, I think we should, we could probably marry the two a little bit better, but. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah because I think it'd that, be really hard to go to your boss and be like, we're just going to play and see what happens. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I think... It, I, you know, I should have told you to check it out, but anybody that's watching, I want I want to get Marquez on the show, but I, you know, he's a million and a half followers. I can't get near him. Um, go check him out and 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 follow up with me, because I, I I think once you kind of see the, and, I mean, because he does it in a very strategic way, but I mean, it's just again, it's you know, it's it's from a different place, and sure. I just we always hear people, how do I get more engaged, or how do I get more? I mean, it's just I hear the same. I mean, I'm not even in it, and I hear people, you know, at industry events like talk about, it, and it's just. Makes me want to punch somebody in the face and it drives me nuts. Well, you know, the thing like the engagement, everybody's shutting down their blog comments, and you should ask Rogan about that next week because he just shut his down. Like, there's not going to be engagement. There's not going to be community if you don't allow people to have a conversation. Well, here's one final question, wrapping it up, if we're talking about community and public relations and communicating in general. Um, there comes a point where I, I think somebody hits a certain level to where it just becomes counter not, not counterproductive it's a terrible it's that's a pretty terrible word but it becomes almost like it's their full-time job to keep up with some of those tasks i mean how do they at what point you know i mean you can tell by the people that you follow online i mean the, the, some of the people that i follow online are the people that actually will respond to me those that don't i obviously fall off because they just there's too many people is it too mm -hmm. many people or are they just lazy or don't have good systems in place um, yes, it could be all of those things, and it could be that they built community that didn't wasn't beneficial to the business, and now they're having to take a step back. Um, it, you know, it could be a, a myriad of things. So, but you're but you're still advocating that community. I am, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you saw Marcus and I disagree about it in San Diego. <laughs> I mean, because I, I mean, I, I I completely agree from a business standpoint. It's like, listen, I'm not going to expect you to answer my email. You know, some some kid in Cleveland who you know you've never met before. Um, you know, but at the same time, I mean, and, you know, Chris Brogan, he's pretty good at that. You know, I mean, for the tons yeah. of people yeah. that he he has, you know, I, I walked across the uh, the hotel lobby with him, and we did not make it. We could not make it through the lobby because that's how many people <laughs> stopped him. I mean, the dude must be fantastic at taking three steps at a time. I don't know how he walks <laughs> like when he's not at conferences. It's uh, ridiculous. But I mean, so I mean, that's just kind of the example of of you know when it gets to be that point, and I mean, it's sometimes be careful what you wish for, I guess. Yeah, and I also think you have to look at it strategically and say, okay, what part of this makes sense for the business, and what part doesn't. Do you have any tips to before we wrap up as to what would make sense for businesses and what would not? 
you know, when you can you can you can point to eighty percent of your revenue that comes from people who read your blog and comment and, and engage in the, the space, then it probably makes sense for you to keep it up. If you're like Chris and I read his blog post about it this morning, where you're getting tons of spam and it's getting unruly and it's not driving revenue, then yeah, it probably makes sense to cut the comments off. All right. Well, Jenny, I do appreciate you taking the time. It's been a pleasure uh, talking with you, and hopefully um, we didn't ruffle too many feathers. And, um, Just each other's. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, why don't you go ahead, uh, where do you want people to go to check you out? I know you got the book, Spin Sucks, that just was uh, released a couple months ago. What do you want people to go do, how to find you, and all that fun stuff? SpinSucks.com is the easiest, easy to spell, easy to find, everything's there. Everything's there. Spin sucks. All right, Jeannie, well, before I let everybody go, before I let you go, I do want to tell everybody, remind them that we are launching this whole new thing. Uh, and the one thing that if you could do, if you think you know you want to hear some more fearless questions, is to go ahead and subscribe over in iTunes. Feel free to tell us what you think about what's going on here. Uh, feel free to leave your own fearless question. I don't know what iTunes is going to do with it, but let's see if we can break it and see what happens. So Try to break um, it. <laughs> yeah, so I'll drop a link to the iTunes uh, subscribe uh, link in the event page, and uh, it'll be wherever you want it to be, too. So, uh, Jeannie, again, appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Joey, Joey, thank you. It's a pleasure. Hey, thanks a lot. We'll take it easy. See you guys later.